This week I thought we would do something that we haven't done in a while and it's fix one of these basket case bowls. Uh, there's the knot goes all the way through to the back side. And um, anyway, if you're if you're a wood turner, you've probably got a lot of these in your inventory, as do I. And you know, you'll take a substandard bowl blank like this that you know you could just trim this the way it is and finish it and then do a little bit of filler down in here and call it done or you can cut out this area and do an inlay in the rim and you know add a lot of value to it so that's what we're going to do in this video i'm going to cut this all out down in here and somehow i'm going to incorporate this braided copper wire in the side and I was thinking that we would use some sumac branches and these are actually have actually been stabilized but the centers are still pretty bad on them so what I'm going to do is actually drill out these centers after we get them in place and then we'll use some sort of resin or epoxy not exactly sure on the color yet but uh, that's this video so first things first we're going to uh, Clean this bottom off, get a glue block on it, get it trimmed up, and cut this area out. First off, I'd like to thank you for dropping in to watch this video. And if you're new here, this is predominantly a wood turning channel. And I do anything from working with natural inlays, resin work, uh, natural wood pieces, uh, you name it. I uh, don't do a lot of segmented work. That's probably the only thing that I really don't do a lot of. So we're going to get a glue block on the bottom of this and then we'll be able to get it on the lathe. So before we can do any inlay work, uh, and I like to call it inlay work, it's a lot of resin work this time around. But we are using some, some branches and some twisted copper wire, which is something that I haven't really done before. A little bit, but the way that I've inlaid it this time in the rim, I certainly have not. So if you rough your bowls out one inch thick for every 10 inches in diameter, and this, this is a twice turned bowl. So I rough the piece out. It sat on the shelf in my drying shed for six months. And then it's bit, been through my fridge kiln and now it's 7% or drier. But when you rough your bowls out properly, then you have lots of material to turn away to chew that bowl up when you twice turn it. So I'm just going to take some last little shearing cuts. Uh, this is a 5 8 bowl gouge from Robust. I'm still getting used to it. I pretty much only use the David Ellsworth 5 8 bowl gouge, but uh, again, this was a gift from, from Tracy, so I'm, I'm, I'm getting used to it. Uh, one thing that I do like about it, it does seem to hold its edge very well, so happy days. That's, uh, that's an important thing when you're talking wood turning tools and uh, the longevity of them, because of course, the, the better the tool steel, the less sharpening you'll need to do. And then, of course, that adds basically to your bottom line in every way because you're not at the grinder, you're at the lathe turning, and you don't have to buy as many gouges. So, uh, so far so good with this robust tool. I'm still working on the grind a little bit. I really like the, uh, the Ellsworth grind, the swept back wings on it, and those long, long high wings that allow you to do shear scraping on the outside of the bowl. But um, there'll be some people that also think that this is excessive where I didn't have to do this, where I could have just, you know, fixed it in a few areas and left it as it is. And you know what? You're right. That certainly could have been done. But I've also noticed in the years that people will look at turnings like that where you left the knot in there and you just filled in around it as a repair and not as a... Um, you know, an inlay or an enhancement. So that's one thing to consider as well. This is a large bowl, large piece of walnut, and it's uh, this bowl by itself is easily in the $350 to $400 category uh, without any inlay work. 
to give you an idea of what something like this would cost without any inlay work in it. So of course, by, by sticking an inlay in this piece, you're going to add value to it. And uh, it certainly makes it a lot more unique than just leaving that little, well, it's not a little, it's quite a large knot because it goes all the way to the base. And um, anyway, by all means, share your thoughts. Uh, but this is one of the things that I'm known for in the wood turning world. Well, I just drew this on and I didn't realize the camera wasn't on. Uh, anyway, uh, I like to flare these at the top to give it a little bit of style. I don't know, it's a little wider maybe down here. We'll cut this out and then we'll grind it back till we get a pleasing shape that we want. Uh, this time hopefully somebody turns the camera on. There you see, good. One of them days. Some people have been wondering about a uh, review on the power cap, and that is coming. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's one thing that I typically have to do each morning, well, throughout the day, really, with the filters being in front of the, the unit, any dust that's kicked up is immediately kind of sucked into them. So uh, if you're wearing one of these and you're, and you're noticing that there seems to be a reduced airflow, that's because the front of the filter is, uh, is plugged up. But anyway, I, I will cover that in a video. Please be patient. I know that some people are, are looking for that. Just pointing out that when this bowl was drying, I actually dumped in a bunch of thin CA glue, CA glue to keep it from migrating. That's a Typhoon bit. Uh, I get them at Lee Valley here in Canada. There should be a link in the description, I believe, for the Typhoon bits. They sell a whole different line of them. But it does a real good job cleaning up the roughness left over from the jigsaw. And, you know, there's any number of ways you could cut this out of here. Uh, I've even used a router. But the problem with a router is it can be quite grabby. And then all of a sudden your, <laughs> your slot that you cut gets a lot larger. So that's why I typically don't use a use a router anymore. I have used a, um, a Sawzall that actually will work pretty decent as well. But um, as long as these Typhoon bits are fairly new, they, you, you, as you can see, it eats up this walnut pretty good. So I'm very impressed with these Typhoon bits. And I have them in all different sizes as well. This one I use predominantly just to clean up long spaces like that. And the other thing when it comes to making these cutout areas, don't just go in straight. Give it some style, some pizzazz, uh, some visual interest. I could have gone just straight in and then, you know, made it basically wide enough to stick the branches in and, and you know, put the resin in and call it a day. But uh, to me, I'm always looking for that flair and that bling, if you will. All right, that's it for today. Uh, the reason for that is because I started late. <laughs> so anyway, it's five o'clock and I'm gonna shut her down. It's a good practice to put, uh, when you first trim these bowls, it's a good practice to let them sit overnight. And that will, the tension of course, will release in the wood. And if you've ever turned a bowl and didn't put any finish on it and then notice the next day that it moved a lot, well, that's probably because it's got a lot of uh, tension in the wood and now it's, now it's moving. So it's good to let these sit overnight. And then the next day, after you turn back, it should be all good to go. See you tomorrow. So like I said earlier, we're gonna be using sumac. And sumac, is it's just got a really strange color. And that's why I like using it. Uh, it's just something different here in Canada anyway. So we're just gonna cut these to an oversized length. And typically when I stabilize branches, I stabilize them in the eight to 10 inches in length mark. That way afterwards you've got lots of options as far as cutting sizes are concerned. And the other thing is this braided copper wire is really slick. So I'm using some 180 here just to give it a tooth for the resin to bond to it. All right, so getting ready to put the inlay in here. Uh, the, I sprayed this with spray lacquer. Uh, that will hopefully prevent any 
resin penetrating into the wood. So I just sprayed it around the outside and on the inside, like so there you can see a little bit of too much. So anyway, I don't know if that's going to be an issue. In all likelihood, it probably isn't going to be because this is going to have to be trimmed back quite a bit before it's actually finished. So, but anyway, better to err on the side of caution than to not do it at all. All right, so, you know, this is a preference as to how you want to do it. Uh, there's, I've got all kinds of different branches. And of course, these are stabilized branches. They're not, uh, they're not just normal branches. And uh, the hearts in these will probably have to get done. But anyway, I'm just going to lay these in along with the wire and, and we'll see what, we're, what we get. I do want to leave some spaces for the resin to sit. Uh, but other than that, it's uh, pretty simple to do. Of course, the way that you lay these out, well, that's all you. Uh, the, your vision and how you see the branches working, that's all on you. Uh, we are going to be using the Starbond Thin before we do any casting with this. That will hold the branches in place and I'll be able to grind them back and we'll be able to get some plastic on them. But I thought I'd briefly talk about when I was actually doing shows and basically a production turner. And so what I would do, my typical week would be, I would manage between 20 to 25 bowls like this a week. Some would be just inlays in the rim. Some would be repair jobs like this. It's hard to find a good, clean bowl blank. It is here in Canada anyway. So you'll find that um, you're going to have a lot of bowls like this in your inventory and it's a shame to see them, you know, go to the fireplace or wherever. So, you know, I always made it a conscious effort to to save these pieces, especially walnut and cherry, you know, the higher end uh, pieces of wood. It's, it'd be a shame to see them go to, go to waste. So that's kind of where this was all spawned from because I had so much of this stuff in my inventory and wanted to use it up. Uh, rarely did I not inlay a bowl because that's kind of where the code inlay gym comes from. So my typical production would be to get all them homemade face plates and glue blocks on the bottom of each and every one of them bowls, trim up all 20, 25, whatever it is that week, and then fix the major flaws. In the meantime, those bowls are sitting there relaxing and the tension's coming out of them and they're either absorbing a little bit of moisture or maybe even possibly losing some moisture if it's being done in the winter time because it's so dry here. And then when it came time, to swing around and true those up, uh, I just found that that was the, the the most effective way to do this many inlays in a week. So I, I kind of miss that aspect of my wood turning, but in a way, I'm glad that it's kind of gone because now I'm able to do a lot more artistic stuff. And that's really where I want to take my channel, more on the artistic side. Well, that was very hard to film. I know you guys probably didn't see a whole lot. This here. Uh, next thing we're going to do is take this over on the lathe and grind this all back to the surface so that we can get some plastic on here and then pour some resin. So to elaborate on what I was saying earlier, when those bowls are sitting up there and that tension's released, uh, the next time you, you, you true them up, they typically will stay like that and not move afterwards. Wood is an organic thing and it does move with the seasons. So a lot of people don't realize that, you know, in the winter time when it's dry, that bowl will pull in on itself ever so slightly, even though it's kiln dried, it's still going to move because it's an organic thing. Uh, probably the only way around that would be to completely encase it in epoxy. Then maybe it wouldn't get any movement, <laughs> but, uh, in most cases that we don't do that. Uh, here I'm grinding out the hearts of the sumac, the ones that will stay in place. And I made the mistake of not drilling out the real small ones. I eventually do that with a drill, but I just, 
I tried it a little bit and I just didn't like the results it was giving me. It was just, you got to be careful you don't go through the sidewall because you definitely don't want to do that. But grinding back those branches will allow you to lay some plastic in there and then you'll be able to uh, pour some epoxy down and to hold these in for good. I must say it does give a really neat effect. I do like the finished product. And the last thing that I want to do before we put any plastic on here prior to casting is to just grind down some of those branches where there's some sharp edges left on them, where the, um, the wires were sticking through. I was worried about them puncturing through the plastic, so that's why I'm using some 60 grit on the drill here. And it, uh, it actually smoothed things off really nicely uh, prior to putting the plastic on. Now, if you've been here for a while, you know that I was using 6mm poly for a long time to do this. Uh, but I find this material uh, a lot better. And what it is, is I got it at Costco and it's actually to go on to the metal uh, shelving units that they have. And that, you know, prevents, say, dust falling between the shelves. But it's really flexible and strong. Like it actually takes quite a bit to to rip it apart, unlike 6 mil poly, of course. Uh, double layer of glue just to make sure that things are gonna not leak, because, uh, well, we've had issues with that in the past. <laughs> but I do find that going forward from now on that I'll probably be using this material here, and I've got two rolls of it, so, you know, that's that'll provide a lot of material for inlay, that's for sure. I should have left it a little wider at the top, that way, because um, I want the resin to, or the epoxy to sit on the top of this as well to act as a little reservoir for the piece to pull from when it needs it. But other than that, I'm very happy with the way that this was made prior to casting. There, that took way longer than it should have. <laughs> But uh, let's hope it doesn't leak. I sure got enough glue in there that it shouldn't, but I guess we'll see. Let's mix up some resin. This week we're going to be using ArtCast. The great thing about this is it will be ready to go tomorrow. And the other benefit about ArtCast is it's really super clear. Uh, not really so much a, a thing here, but if you are looking for uh, a resin that's really clear, this is definitely it. So we're going to use the swamp green and the jungle green and uh, hopefully that will give us a really cool look. Well, there is quite a difference between the two of them. So we'll have to see how that is. Uh, what I'm going to do is throw these in the clean room, uh, get some heat into them. When they hit around 45 to 50, we'll do the pour. That way hopefully we can get some color separation uh, I know that these are, you know, I should have maybe mixed something else, but uh, I don't know, it'll be interesting to see the two greens together. See you in a bit. So where you're at. What was that? 51.3, so it's time to pour and just hope that I've got enough. Yeah, unfortunately, I think these are just going to combine and make one color. I'm just encouraging it to go down inside here, trying to move some air pockets. There, I don't see any more now. Maybe a little bit. All right, I'm going to put this in the pressure pot while I can. See you guys tomorrow. All right, so it is, uh, I don't know, three days later, actually. Something like that. And uh, in order to get this glue off, we're going to be using some of this isopropanol alcohol. 
And uh, I have tried this with limited success. So you soak it down and then you essentially peel up the hot milk glue. We'll just give that a minute to soak in and then we'll use the screwdriver and peel it up. Hopefully. For the record, I could have left this in place and just simply turned it away. Uh, the problem is with with material like this, when you break it free, it may turn around and slap your knuckles. And uh, so I prefer to move it because I don't want my knuckles being slapped when I'm <laughs> when I'm when I'm on the lathe. I had enough of that when I was in school, so, <laughs> so I don't want it when I'm on the lathe. I I wasn't this time around for some reason. This didn't really work all that great. I I sprayed this down probably two times before turning the camera on as well. So it was definitely on there and uh, wasn't coming off anytime soon. Uh, not on its own anyway. So this is the number three Hercules from Hunter Tool Systems. And I'll remind you that in the description down below are the links to all of the sponsors on my channel. And that way you can go down there, click on that link. And as long as you use code InlayGem at checkout, you'd be able to put some money back in your pocket. So the goal right now is just to strip off all the excess epoxy and when that's done we'll be able to look at this piece and figure out exactly what we're going to be uh, doing with this. Since sumac is so soft it's hard to get the branches cut cleanly. That was a little area that didn't get filled with the resin so no big deal I just whittled it down and basically got rid of it. I had planned on making the foot a little larger when I cut this piece off and we'll see that later on but getting that clean cut on that end grain sumac when it's so soft is is not an easy thing to do uh the the epoxy certainly did harden it up a bit but it was still tough to get a good clean cut on it even with a new cutter So we did get the quote back for the workshop and I told you that I would share that here. Um, so it did come in a little higher than expected, but you know, as my builder said, right now the building materials here in Canada are just a stupid crazy price. So I'm gonna be putting up a 36, the original plan was to put up a 36 by 50 workshop with a half bath. And along with that, I was gonna use an air to air heat pump for heating and cooling. Uh, anyway, that quote came in at $185,000, and that's in Canadian funds. Uh, the real kind of kick in the, in the junk is the 15% tax that's on top of that. So that now jumps at to $213,000. Painful.
As far as the house is concerned, I, I'm not going to give you some numbers on that. I'm, I'm going to leave that private, but uh, it's coming in considerably higher than we thought it would or hoped it would. Uh, but again, you know, when there's a shortage on labor and a shortage on building, well, shortage on labor, that's good labor and labor you can trust. There's a certain YouTuber on here that's been going through quite a quite a painful experience. And I'm not going to say their name, but <laughs> if you're uh, if you're watching wood turning channels, you probably know who I'm talking about. So, you know, it's important to go with a good solid builder and um, we think that we've got a good solid builder, but you know, he's just, he's basically passing on the price that he's getting back from his sub trades. And uh, you know, it's basically out of his hands. And, uh, but it's, um, it's painful that, that the tax is probably the real killer. Uh, last time we built a house, we only had to pay 5% GST and with it now being 15%, it really drives the cost of everything up you know we often wonder why people aren't building houses and that's because they can't afford to build houses and part of that is is due to the tax uh, hey if you wanna we've got a housing crisis here in Canada if you wanna actually do something about it the government should be axing the tax and that way maybe people will build more houses so unfortunately that means we're gonna have to make some cuts somewhere uh my shop originally was in was going to be 36 by 50 and we're going to take four feet off of the length of that that's still going to be a large shop at 46 by 36 uh and there'll be some things inside the house that will finish as well like uh for instance the basement that's why it's important for you to watch and click on each and every ad that comes up on your screen to help me pay uh, the taxes that are going to come with this workshop in the house. Uh, <laughs> anyway, all joking aside, it's it's a bit frustrating to live in a country, the second largest country in the world, that has a vast forest with pine, spruce, and, and fir in it uh, that, of course, is made for, for lumber and plywood and have it as, as as expensive as it is here to build uh, anything, really. A dog house would cost you a million dollars to build it right now. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it, you know, it is what it is, and there's no, all we can hope for is that next year, maybe the prices of things will come down slightly. Uh, the interest rate is fairly high here, so that's killing construction as well. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> It's just, uh, it's a bit frustrating at, at the moment, but uh, you know, uh, such is life and it is what it is and there's no, uh, there's no way around it at this point, except for hopefully prices might come down. Hopefully. So some of these sumac branches are tearing out pretty bad because they're soft. So I'm going to use the thin star bond here and we'll harden this up and then hopefully we can get a good clean cut on them. So you've seen me use this method many times. At this point, try and keep it off of the end grain of the bowl because it may wick in a little too far. As long as no sanding has taken place to open up the pores of the wood, then usually it doesn't penetrate really all that deeply. Uh, so keep that in mind when you're doing this. Uh, the problem with this being done on end grain is you can really stain it. Anyway, I'll give that about, uh, I don't know, 10 minutes or so, and then we'll get back at it. Here I've switched back to the Ellsworth gouge. Uh, the one thing that the Robust, I think the Robust has deeper flutes on it than the Ellsworth gouge does and so anyway this is freshly sharpened and I know that I can get some really decent um, shear scraping done with this and you'll see me pick up the shavings here in a minute and it's pretty much exactly what you're looking for really fine shavings and as you know that CA glue didn't penetrate very far into the bowl because I'm really just shaving off no more than probably a 30 second so this is an elevated view of me outboard, well it'd be 
basically turning the entire bowl. And the main pur purpose of this view is to show you how I'm holding the gouge and how it's tucked into my hip. And I'm swaying back and forth on my hips. And, you know, there's not really a lot of arm movement. I've got a fair bit of down pressure to make sure that the tool doesn't bounce on the tool rest. But for the most part, it's just swaying back and forth and let my hips do the walking or the turning, <laughs> if you will. When you move to the inside of the bowl, it's certainly a little harder to do. And this is probably why a lot of turners find turning the inside of a bowl a lot harder than turning the outside of the bowl. And that's because now you're reliant upon more arm work and not so much swaying back and forth on your hips like you can on the outboard side. So anyway, I, th I thought that this would be an interesting view and I might throw some more of these views up in the future. Uh, but yeah, tell me down in the comments if, uh, if you like seeing maybe more footage like this as opposed to up close uh, shots of the, the edge of the tool. Just really curious about that. So when it comes to sanding, power sanding, as opposed to just sanding by hand, uh, again, on the inside of the bowl, it's more challenging to do than it is on the outside of the bowl. Again, it's a lot of arm work when you're working on the inside of the bowl. And, and when you're working on the outside of the bowl, which, you know, I've got a shot of that coming up, you can basically steady that drill against your body and again, sway back and forth on your hips. Uh, I should mention that we are sanding from 60 to 180 and then I'll have a look at things and, and see what repairs and fixes need to be done at that point. There's that drill tucked into my side and you know that really does help with you know taking the pressure off of your joints. I do have a natural shelf for my left arm to rest on <laughs> but uh, it'll work for those that don't have that natural shelf as well. I just couldn't leave uh, those sumac branches without something in them. Uh, it was bothering me. So I uh, just found a smaller drill bit than the Typhoon bit that I used and I drilled them out and so that we can take care of them too. So anyway, I can't help myself. I got to fill these holes. <laughs> so we're going to use the UV resin. And, uh, you know, looking at this piece, it's pretty much the swamp green look I think. I might combine a little bit of the two colors just to try and match it up. I uh, It's just, I don't know, if you've been around for a while, you know what I'm like. I didn't actually think that I achieved any color separation here but I certainly did after it was polished out you could definitely see it so happy days. But at the time, I didn't think that I really had much of it. All right, we'll go with that. Of course, this stuff is cured with a UV light and sumac glows under a UV light. So that's really cool. Turn these lights off. Pretty cool, eh? Anyway, I'll throw this on here and leave it for oh, a good six minutes, I'm thinking, maybe longer. And uh, I'll work my way around the bowl and fill in all those areas, and we'll see you back on the lathe. Once the UV resin was cured, I threw it back on the lathe. I uh, certainly don't want to do any tool work at this stage, so I just took the 180 grit and ground back any excess to the surface. And then once that was done, I turned the lathe on and blended, all, blended it all in. And this piece was sanded up to 400. Didn't see the need to go much higher. Any of the little resin areas, not really all that large. So sanding this piece to 800, really, I didn't see the benefit to it. And of course, I wanna do an inlay in the top list, as you've seen in the thumbnail. So, important to have a really sharp parting tool here so this was freshly sharpened 
And then once I get the groove to the size that I want, I'm just going to take some 180 to make sure that there's no tear out in there. Well, all right, you know what time it is. It's finish time, and this is Waterlux Gloss. There it is, and I must say that I do like it. You cannot tell the difference from where I filled in those hearts. What do you think of that little copper wire in there? Just a little bit of bling. Beautiful Canadian black walnut, the king of North American hardwoods. Anyway, let me know in the comments what you think. See you tomorrow when we do the inlay. Well, it is the next day. Uh, I've just been trying to figure out the best way to use this braided copper. And I didn't think that it was going to be as difficult of a medium to work with that it's turned out to be. Uh, but it certainly is. Uh, it's kind of got a memory of its own. My original plan was to run two runs of this and then cut it off. But the problem is, in order for it to meet up to the other end, it's got to cross the other one. So that's no good. It doesn't look good. So then what I did was I cut off one, we'll fit it on the inside and pull it as tight as we can. And then the other one will cut the length as well. Uh, the one thing that I have been doing because it will fall apart on you is I've been taking the ends and then just putting a drop of the thin CA glue on it from Starbond and then hitting it with the accelerator and that really stiffens the ends up so that you can match them up properly hopefully I've just got these roughly cut to size uh, still need to do the final fitting I, unfortunately I, I'm gonna try and adjust the camera so you can see but you know it's just a very difficult thing to do and, and to film at the same time. I think what I'm going to have to do is glue one end down and then hopefully I can manipulate it to get the right measurement before I cut it off. There now hopefully I can pull this tight because I want these to be set in there perfectly. because it'll drive me crazy if I don't have it in there perfectly. Now I put glue on this before and it's wicked up the piece. So when I cut this off, it should be still good. And I don't know where my good side cutters went to. I gotta look for them. I don't know. These will do. I'm just checking my to make sure that I've got the right length, because after I glue this all the way down, it could be a problem <laughs> on this upper end. It looks pretty good to me. All right, so I'm just going to kind of spot glue this all the way around till I get to uh, where the ends join. Making sure to seat it too.
Must be a little bit too long. Just a smidge. I might try and just kind of use some sandpaper. Okay, so one opening's here. I'll do one over here. So this ended up being way harder than I thought it was going to be. I thought this was going to be a breeze, but <laughs> in reality, uh, because that wire has a memory, and I tried stretching it, but because it's twisted, it's got a memory, and it just was a really difficult thing to, to actually work with. But eventually we get the job done here. Now my original plan with this was to, you know, put this wire in here and then just pour the epoxy on top of this and leave it as it is below it. But I don't know, it's, it's uh, maybe up in some areas, it's very hard to stick down and keep in place. So anyway, we're going to still do the epoxy, but we might have to sand down to it. And I really didn't want to do that because then you might have all these wires sticking up. Anyway, let's mix up some resin. We'll get this in the pressure pot and then, uh, well, we'll see how we make out tomorrow. Our cast is nice and clear, so it's a good choice for this. Uh, it's getting a little cool here, so I just warmed up some water in the microwave and then mixed the uh, epoxy together in that and it worked well. All right, so this is inside of my pressure pot. The bowl's been leveled. I've put the art cast into a syringe like this. And uh, sorry, this is the best view I can give you. And it's going to be even tight for me to even put this in. But I will do my best. I don't have really good depth perception because I can't get close enough to it. Um, this is one of the reasons why I put finish on this bowl because if this resin or this epoxy decides to go over the edge, at least there's a coat to protect the uh, wood from getting any staining in it. I think that's it. I don't think it can take any more than that. Anyway, I'll get the lid on this, get it pressurized, and we'll see you guys tomorrow. All right, well, it's been a couple of days, and when this was in the pressure pot, it must have shifted a little bit. And it's down on this side and up on this side. Now, I'm hoping that this isn't going to be an issue. I uh, definitely want to try and not get into this copper wire but you know if I do I do there's not really much I can do about it it will still look neat Very light cuts here. If you're too aggressive, you might get some chip out and then, well, you may end up basically destroying the inlay on the very top of this. So we certainly don't want to do that. So very light cuts. In the end, uh, I was able to sand this piece out and not break through the resin. Watching it rotate here on the lathe, it actually looks like it's stuck down pretty well too. That, you know, there, there's, it's not really up in any areas. So that was good because it, the way it was sitting in there, it, was, it wasn't giving me positive vibes. <laughs> it didn't look like it anyway. 
Uh, as far as sanding is concerned, I started sanding at 80 and went all the way to 800 on the top of this just because I, I want that clarity um, before we uh, put the finish on. And when power sanding, reversing the lathe direction and the drill direction between grits will give you a better surface. Once that's done, we'll use the Triple E buffing compound to buff the top inlay and the inlay on the side. Maybe wasn't necessary, but I did it anyway. And then uh, we'll get things cleaned up with some denatured alcohol and get our second coat of finish on. But technically, we're back to the first since we sanded the first one off. Good morning, this is the second coat of Waterlux Gloss. Well, there's the second coat. It will definitely take three. That resin or sorry, that epoxy is really awesomely clear. Awesome. Okay, I'll do the third coat the same way and we'll see you when we're doing the bottom. So after its third coat, it was time to free it from the waste block. Uh, I think I said earlier that the foot was going to get turned down, and that's what I'm doing here. I don't know if it's the one-third rule or not, and if you're not familiar with that. When you're making bowls for aesthetics and for stability, they say that your foot should be one-third the size of the diameter of your bowl. Uh, that way the proportions look properly when you're looking at them. And just using a handsaw here uh, instead of having the bowl break off and go flying across the shop because nobody wants that. This is the vacuum chuck and I think I only took three attempts to get it correctly. That's how I usually uh, usually do it. Anyway, I just used the Ellsworth gouge on the bottom of this and the bottom was sanded from 120 to 320. Well, hopefully you enjoyed the video. Uh, please leave a comment down below. That way you can help me out with some channel analytics. Uh, this is a fun project, uh, but it was a challenging one. Well, all right, let's have a last little look at this beauty little bowl. Well, it's actually not little. It's actually a fairly large bowl. I really love the look of the sumac and the fact that we got color separation from two colors that are, you know, there's differences in them, but you know, I was really, I was really hoping that they wouldn't combine, and they sure enough they didn't. You see it throughout the piece. Uh, the copper wire. I'll show you at the inlay. That's the coolest area. Get that to shine correctly. Come in, hopefully. Anyway, it is super clear. Uh, that art cast is a really good. Uh, resin for this and that will actually that will add a lot of strength to the rim as well so very cool i'll put the metric conversion up on the screen but this is 13 and three quarters of an inch across and almost five and a half inches tall and it's around five eighths of a dent of an inch in, in thickness so uh you need that thickness in order to get the inlay in the rim and of course i like my beefy bowls anyway here is the very bottom of this piece and uh, yeah there's no finish on it <laughs> as for normal I'm running out of time uh, but I'll be honest with you this was a lot more labor than I anticipated uh, especially the copper wire dealing with that was a bit of a pain I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie it was so uh, I don't know moving forward I don't know if I'll make another one of these or not but uh, anyway it, it is a very cool effect and uh, I'll show it with the rotating footage at the end like I usually do and hopefully you can get a good look at it. Three coats of the water lux and I do get off and I get asked often if it's if it's food safe. Jeez, I can't talk today. It is food safe once it's fully cured and so is the designer epoxy. All of their 
product line, once everything is fully cured, it's all food safe. So that if you're worried about uh, contact with food, once it's all cured up, it is ready to, uh, to be used for that. All right, I'm gonna set this down. Anyway, that piece is for sale, and if you're interested, send me an email to spraguewoodturning at gmail.com, and I will disclose the price then. Uh, you may notice that that is my play button. Uh, I haven't shot a video, I haven't opened it. I've had it for two days, and I haven't opened it yet. I'm waiting to do an unboxing video, so uh, hopefully this week. I'll try and put that up midweek sometime. So please come in for that, and again, thank you all for those who got me over 100,000 subscribers. I truly do, do do appreciate it. Next week is going to be a copper themed project. And I'm just going to leave it at that. But I've already, I think, hit some problems. So we'll have to see how it goes. Because that's just, that's just the way we roll here. <laughs> we seem to be uh, fixing issues. Uh, but anyway, that's next week. Take care. Stay safe. Don't forget the bell. Please share my videos with your friends. And of course, that thumbs up will always help with the analytics. And if you haven't subscribed, please do that. Um, I would really appreciate it. See you next week.